Did you realize that even institutional investors, high-end people like CFAs and cabinet ministers and people who have MBAs and finance backgrounds are susceptible to the whole problems of biases and the challenges of emotional investing and changing their course just like you? Let's have a discussion about what it looks like when even the pros start losing their nerve. Make Better Wealth Decisions, a podcast that explores how financial advisors' blind spots can harm your investments. I'm your host, John DeGuy, a portfolio manager with Design Securities in Toronto. In this podcast, we'll provide advice on how you can achieve better outcomes by maximizing investments and minimizing taxes. Let's put our thinking caps on as we consciously decide to get smarter about our money. Sulman Ahmed is the Chief Investment Officer at Steadyhand, which is a firm that provides accessible and affordable investment advice to over 4,000 Canadians. He's also the Vice Chair of Fair Canada, which is Canada's leading advocate for the rights of individual investors, and the President of the Board of Directors at the CFA Society in Vancouver. Sulman, welcome. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me. I think it would be good if we could get to know you a little bit just to get started off. And um, you cut your teeth. You began uh, with a career in institutional consulting. And there are not a lot of people that start on the institutional side and then move over to retail. So perhaps you can tell us about that journey as we get going. Sure. Yeah. As you mentioned, I did. Uh, I was a pension consulting. So investment consultant working with large pension plans. These are pension plans with hundreds of millions and often billions of dollars, endowments, foundations, the kinds of investors that are considered sophisticated, if I could, you know, high-powered investment committees. It was a lot of fun, but I cut my teeth during the financial crisis. There's nothing like a big financial crisis where the financial system is on its knees to test uh, behavior of people. And even those folks that you might think are are very sophisticated, as I said. And as we went through, the, uh, through this financial crisis, specifically in, in 07, I, I would go to these investment committees, 07 and 08, I should say, I would go into these investment committees, and these are committees comprised of really high-powered people, right? Um, C CEOs, CFOs, ministers, really high-powered folks. And it was remarkable to see their behavior when the market was going down. They were asking whether they should sell everything or if they should materially change their investment plan as a result of some of the happenings in the market. Um, there were folks that were asking whether these long-term plans that they were, and remember, these pension plans have liability studies that are set out for decades, and their asset mix, their mix of stocks and bonds and other investments reflects those liabilities. Well, they wanted to throw that out the window because of this financial crisis. So that really woke me up to this, to the human side of it that I hadn't thought of. When you're in university, you really just, you look at textbooks, you understand the concepts and the stats and the economics behind it. But it's really when you see people behaving the way they do that, that you realize, hey, all that is good. But when the rubber hits a road, Humans are humans, regardless of how sophisticated they may be or not be. And I made the decision after that, that if these folks were experiencing the kind of mental stress and anxiety, imagine how the average person who you sit next to on the subway or the streetcar or the bus might be behaving. So I, I made a very conscious decision to move from institutional world to working with individuals in what's known as retail world. Yeah. It's funny because you telling that story reminds me of what I went through. I've been a financial advisor for 31 years, and it was uh, as a direct uh, result of the global financial crisis that I chose to become a portfolio manager. So I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Richard Thaler's con uh, concept of libertarian paternalism. Okay, you are good. Okay, so he talks about nudging people and getting them to, to choose what hopefully will be in their best interest without ever forcing anything down anyone's uh, throat. So I had been a traditional advisor uh, working on a collaborative basis with my clients. They all had investment policy statements. We were all doing exactly what you're talking about with your pension committee. We have a plan. We're going to stick to the plan. And then the global financial crisis hits. And I told everyone, look, you've got this portfolio. Let's say it's 
and stocks are on sale now. So what we need to do is we need to sell some of your bonds to buy stocks while they're on sale and get back to the 60-40 target. And virtually none of my clients would do it. I told them all to do it. I told them all to do it, whatever their mix was. They weren't all 60-40, some were 80-20, some were 50-50. But at any rate, I, you know, I, I would tell them to, that this is now an opportunity to rebalance the portfolio, to buy low on the stock side. And um, maybe two of them did it. And maybe two of them said, let's just rewrite the investment policy statement so that the current asset allocation becomes the new target. So we don't have to rebalance, but they felt some cognitive dissonance for not rebalancing. So yeah. they could they could square that. But the other like 90% of my clients didn't do anything. And I had to work with uh, um, portfolios that are out of balance for some time as a result of their refusal to do what they had agreed in writing on the IPS, on the investment policy statement that they would be doing. So I, uh, and it was as a result of that, that I made the decision that I would move from being a garden variety financial advisor to being a portfolio manager, because that would allow me to guide them to do what they told me in writing that they knew should be done, but they didn't have the heart to do it themselves and they wouldn't give me permission. So even though good financial advisors are trying to encourage people to do these things, Sometimes people get in the way and we're all human. And it's funny how we, we had, a, I think, a similar experience. We, we dealt with it in different ways. Same sort of things. High-powered people. Could you maybe offer some thoughts as to why you think these high-powered people who have academic training and are serious and have MBAs and CFAs and are ministers and whatever else succumb to such emotional triggers when they insist that they would never do such a thing? The people have often heard me say, you can have as many accreditations or numbers or letters after your name. It doesn't really mean much until you get that gut punch, just that Mike Tyson comment, right? Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. And so I think I do think there are probably a few reasons, and it probably varies from one person to another. There's no, we can talk about generalizations and, and we will probably for or we will in, in this conversation, but it does vary individual to individual. But often I, I go to the incentives or what's driving that. And for professional investors, incentives are a huge part of what motivates them, what drives them. And, and that's the case with everyone, but perhaps the concept of incentives isn't as closely examined for that type of caliber of, of person. It's almost taken for granted. And when you think about it, investment committees, often have set terms, right? As a committee member, you may have a two, three, four-year term and a chair may have a set a term limit. And then you, know, you got to get voted back in or you got to, or you're going to be voted out. And so it's no surprise that often when these investment committees turn over, there is some change. People want to put their own stamp on things or they don't want something to happen on their watch. It's a bit of a legacy thing. That's not what you want to be remembered for is under your governance, the plan went down or became underfunded or whatever it might be for these situations. So I often, at least in my line of work, I spent a lot of time understanding people's incentives. And that isn't just how they're paid or what their term structures are, or whatever it might be. It, might, it has to do with understanding the business. What are the business dynamics? There's Because incentives also have to do with your colleagues and how you want to, how you work with them or the political environment of an organization that you work within. And so that's something that gets less coverage, but in my experience is a big driver of why at least institutional folks behave the way they do. And, and I say that the book that's over my shoulder there, Bullshift, that I released last year, uh, it talks about how um, optimism bias is a real concern and optimism exists in the industry because people are incentivized to be optimistic. And so the industry shifts your attention to make you feel more bullish. Mm -hmm. And when you were speaking, I was thinking of the Freakonomics book, Stephen Levitt, one of the uh, co-authors of that book is also a prophet, Chicago-like failure. And when they asked, when the publishers asked him and Dubner to come up with a sequel, they asked for a unifying theme for super freakonomics and they pondered about it. And then finally, when they settled on the, the unifying theme is that people respond to incentives. 
people don't want to admit that they have that they're being incentivized and they have certain things and those incentives can be very personal like you say you don't want to see the pension plan have a major drawdown on your watch or you don't want to have to have unfunded liabilities that might come become part of your legacy given your term what about individual at steady hand you're doing a lot of work with individual retail investors what uh, what do you think can be done to help ordinary retail investors, just plain ordinary John Q. Public, uh, John and Jane Doe, to stick with their plan, to think in terms of, no, this is what we agreed we would be doing. This is what's suitable for me, and I'm just going to keep on doing that. It's you know what Stephen Covey would say. It's It's more like a compass. It's not a map. It's pointing me in a general direction, and I don't know what kind of terrain I'm going to encounter, but that's the direction I'm going. How do you get people to do that? Uh, there's a few ways. The first is not being so rigid in a plan in that it, investors expect it to be followed to a T. I often find that we in the industry are guilty of this. We like numbers and we like precision, but it's in many ways, it's pseudo precision because there's probabilities around that. There's all this other stuff that goes with around that. That's where relationships are really useful, especially I'll use the example of retirement. You can have, when someone comes in and they retire, first they go f from a lifetime of seeing their bank accounts grow in value to all of a sudden seeing a deplete in value. That is a mental adjustment. And that mental adjustment can take time for people to deal with. For some folks, it might be very comfortable within a month or two months. For some folks, it takes two to three years. So if you're an advisor or portfolio manager and you're expecting your client to be following this plan to a T and they're unable to, you get frustrated, the client, get, you, you, you're, you're coaching the wrong thing. And that's where I, I often say, well, we should look at ourselves to see what we're doing wrong. And it's not often the clients. It's we haven't set that standard up. This concept of perfection is really unfair. But there are other things too. Managing expectation is one that we have to do. And that has to do with transparency. That has to do with um, when someone comes in Explaining to them that it's not a matter of when the markets are going to go down. Or, sorry, not a matter of if they're going to go down, but when they're going to go down. Yeah. And so at least at Steady Hand, we spend a large amount of time on the onboarding part of it. That allows us to sometimes explain to clients what the difference between a stock and a bond is. That's really fundamental, but it also uh, relays to why an asset makes me include a certain percentage of stocks and bonds, why there's different risks associated with those two. And there are often people that come to our offices that have spent 20 years, maybe more with an advisor that still don't have an understanding of what it is that a stock does or gives you the right to, and what it is that a bond gives you the right to. So we'll start with real basics. So managing expectations and that really basic level education is important. Um, and then the third thing I'd say is just Asking why folks are doing it. You had another guest on your podcast. I can't remember when it was, but behavioral background. And you're just talking about asking the question in different ways. The why, the right. um, um, reversing the question back, mirroring the question. Those kinds of strategies are really important because you and your client, your this your investor, need to be on the same page of what they're trying to do. And and if you're talking why and the other and your client is speaking totally differently then no matter how good a job you think you're doing you're gonna fail in your expectations i think a lot of that then comes down to portfolio construction and mapping the construction to the expectation and as i say it, it can be a challenge because some people don't know what they should be expecting because of their they may be novice investors and even high-powered investment committees can be susceptible to emotional baggage and drawdowns and blind spots. So well, we have our, sorry, sorry, could you have, but we as advisors in the industry and professionals and portfolio managers have our own biases too. And we've got to spend time reflecting on what those biases are. And um, in, in my line, I speak with a lot of investment managers and judging their operations and, and how they manage money. And it's, it's remarkable to me how many have their own biases on stocks, for example. So these, let, let's take a portfolio manager of a stock or of a Canadian equity fund. Most likely this individual 
spent most of their career researching stocks and now is managing a portfolio. But portfolio construction, to your point, is different than just researching the best stock or, or the best investment opportunity. You know, there's diversification impacts. There's one may zig, the other may zag. There's correlation. There's sometimes not enough, too much correlation or, or a very little correlation. All that has an impact. But when I speak to these managers, they're just talking about how good a company this might be that they're looking at, but not enough time thinking about how it fits in with the rest Big of their picture. portfolio. Right, right. And that's a bias that manager has because they've spent most of their career researching stocks. And even as advisors and portfolio managers for individuals, we have our own biases in, in these kinds of things. We've got to get ourselves to see the big picture and, and only then can we help our clients and sometimes see the big picture as well. So a uh, steady hand works with sub-advisors. So you don't really manage the money yourself. You actually hire different people. And so you have an interview process. You might have three or five or I don't know, seven or eight different people who, for instance, have a Canadian equity specialization. You will hire one of them to be the, the manager of record for that sleeve for a Canadian equity mandate. How much of the, your due diligence on your end goes into trying to suss out what those biases might be, because obviously, as, no matter how proficient they may be in doing their main job, if they don't think about how they might integrate what they do and how they might have a bias towards, say, growth, and then there's a U.S. manager who also has a growth bias, and before you know it, you're building a portfolio and all the companies have a growth bias, and you might not have even realized you were doing that because each of the component parts of them by themselves were a best-in-class manager that you've hired. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And uh, this is where folks in my line of work probably spend a lot of time thinking about the research process and the team and those types of things. And I'm not diminishing that. That is absolutely essential to, but that's a corrupt stakes. There's a lot of people do good research. A lot of people or surround themselves with good teammates. But I would say fewer investors, professional investors, really think about aligning their interests with their clients, with their investors, um, understanding their own biases. Portfolio construction, I just mentioned, I spend a lot of time uh, on portfolio construction with managers because it, I find it reveals their own biases in many ways in how they think about regions or industries or just their own behaviors or kind of companies they have, they like over, over other companies. And then also understanding how the team, how the culture dy dynamics within that business are. Is everyone out looking for a job? Is, are, if people are compensated on one year, what are really they going to be driving towards their bonus? I, I've, I've seen investment managers that on paper you would say, John, you would look at and you say, oh, fantastic. Look at this team. Look at this process. Look at all this. All looks good. And they'll say, I'm investing over my time horizon for, for my research is four to seven years. Okay. How are you paid? Well, I'm paid over my uh, three-month performance. Right. Well, it doesn't matter how good your research is over that four-year period, but if your team is incentivized on three-month performance, I can be pretty confident that over time, that You're gonna have a momentum bias. Driving. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. gonna that momentum exactly will show up in the portfolio. So that's where I tend to spend. You're right. Your instincts there are correct. A, a lot of my time is yes, the research process and the team are important, but to me, in fact, more important I find is understanding how they think about portfolio construction, their own biases. I'll, I'll give you one example that I find comes up a lot is the sunk cost bias that managers have. So they'll buy a stock yep. that they did their research on. They might think it's a great business and it may be a good business. Something happens to it. Um, unexpected, whatever it might be, or something fundamental with it. The thesis is fundamentally changed probably after that. But it's remarkable how many investors will say, well, it's already down 20, 30%. So I'm just going to hold on to it. That might be fine. But it also might not be fine. And starting with the, oh, I've, I already own it in the portfolio is probably not 
the right, you know, right behavior in that situation. In fact, there are there. I, I would say the better professional investors are those that pass on the coverage to a fresh set of eyes, or or start with a fresh sheet every day to say, if I were to buy my portfolio today, what would it look like? Would I still own this company? And if not, or if I do, how would I adjust things? So that's something that I see that is absolutely pervasive within our industry. So one of the things I've heard you say is that some of the real drivers of, of behavior and, and financial success are not the things that you would ordinarily expect. And it's not necessarily about, for instance, active versus passive. Yeah. So what would you say are the main determinants of being a successful investor? Yeah, it's often the, le the, the ones that are least sexy, the active versus passive or the a really cool and strategy get headlines and get clicks and, and a lot of ink and I would say bits are, are probably right. taught or used to talk about that. But the things that actually drive wealth, and I love to hear your opinion, whether you agree or not, but in our experience, in my experience, is, is how early you start. You know, it, there's a big delta between someone that starts saving or investing when they're 65 versus they're 55 or 45. Um, another one is how much they're able to put away. Those that are able to start early and put away more. And even those that are able to put $20 away over $5 or $10 consistently, that adds up over time. Um, fees is obvious an obvious one where um, yeah, understanding your fees and ensuring that you're getting bang for, for the buck for your fees is important. Um, your asset mix, the mix of stocks and bonds, not necessarily which, which ones? stocks right. or which bonds, but just the mix of stocks and bonds in your portfolios is what's going to be a big a part of your investor experience. And then something that often, well, it's now getting more um, highlighted more is your own behavior. Do you buy high, sell low? And there's lots of studies that show this concept of behavior gap where people's actual returns are anywhere from 1% to 7% lower than what the market returns are because of their behavior. And interestingly, most of the studies actually include money managed by professional investors, so advisor-driven assets. So it's not just the individual clients that are falling uh, pray yeah. to that, but it's actually professional investors that are guilty of that behavior as well. They themselves are buying high and selling low instead of staying the course. And that is a huge delta over time. Yeah. Imagine over um, 10, 20 years, just how big of an impact that can have on your portfolio. So those are the five things I would say really yeah. drive wealth. The rest is, it's sexy, is interesting, but it's, it's not moving the needle as much as these others. Right. Okay. Great. We're going to be short on time. So let's see if we can wrap this up. If it was up to you, Solman, what, uh, what advice would you give to people listening at home uh, that would help them to make better wealth decisions? What would you say? It sounds cliche, but it is really ask yourself why you're doing it, why you're investing. Get to the real numb of it, not just, oh, I want to retire, but what kind of retirement do you want? Explore that why question really, really well. And then once you've arrived at that, and if you're working with a professional, have a, like a client or have an agreement that you're going to have with yourself or with your advisor on not just what the advisor is going to do, but what you're going to do. So how often are you going to review your statement? How often are you going to call your advisors? Maybe it shouldn't be more than two, three times a year. How much are you going to read about the news? How often are you going to check? It? Just these kinds of things are if you set them up early enough, then when a March 2020 situation happens or if a financial crisis situation happens, you're, that's your guidance, right? That's your guidepost. You will review that agreement, that, that statement that you have, and you say, right, I said this is how I would behave regardless of the circumstances, and that is what I will do. Thank you so much, Solman. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me. John Degui is a portfolio manager with Design Securities in Toronto. The views expressed in this program are not to be construed as specific advice. It is recommended that you consult a qualified advisor before taking action. 
His books, The Professional Financial Advisor 4, Stand Up to the Financial Services Industry and Ball Shift are available through Amazon and in bookstores throughout Canada. You can reach John at 647 Stand Up. That's 647 782 6387 or at jdegui at designedsecurities.ca. 